Hey everyone, welcome to episode 22. My name is Keshav and I'm the producer for this episode. Today's conversation is with Nathan Laird, who is the program manager of the Connector program, which is a public private economic development organization focused on helping the city of Halifax thrive economically, among much more. And he joined Sam to discuss how best to design and write your resume as a student and also networking with a mindset to develop long-term relationships and how best to approach that. And Nathan also shared some of his career progression uh, from when he graduated in school with his undergrad and masters and then uh, so on and so forth from there. And as a graduate without really any co-op experience or directed uh, job experience from, from his, uh, his school. Um, so as I mentioned, he is the program manager of the Connector program. I've linked in the description um, what the Connector program is all about. So you can check out their website and also the app that Nathan mentioned at the end of the episode and at the end of the conversation. I've linked that in as well that you can check out. He's more than happy to, to have a conversation with you. So please reach out to him over LinkedIn. I've linked that in the description. And as always, uh, Sam's info is there as well. Thanks very much and enjoy. Good morning, good afternoon, Nathan Laird. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, you are. Perfect. So before we got on here, um, right before I had all the tech problems that you so graciously uh, worked, worked through with me, I Googled icebreakers. because so I like to start things, things off with a fun question, but I wasn't feeling very fun today. So I had to borrow some fun. And some icebreakers that I came up on were, don't worry, I'm not going to pick all of these. If you were a potato, what kind of potato? If you were a cooked potato, what potato would you be? <laughs> I then, I then had, um, you know, I saw like the the typical like, oh, if you were an animal, what animal would you be? But I liked this one. Um, have you ever been mistaken for someone famous? Uh, no, I did have the um, Mayor Mike Savage once mistake me for Andy Fillmore when I was at a distance on the street. Um, you know, we have a, a very similar hairline from a distance. Uh, but no, I've never been mistaken for someone famous. Who's, a, I, who's Fillmore? Uh, he's our local member of parliament for oh. the peninsula of Halifax. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just asking in case the students don't know. <laughs> Now, actually, going back to your first one about what type of potato would oh, I yeah. be? Okay, I actually, potato. <laughs> I have to answer this one. I would okay. be, I would be a potato skin from the Micmac Tavern. So, if Ooh. anyone who hears this hasn't tried the Micmac Tavern yet, I'll give them a free plug. Absolutely. Uh, what What about their potato skins? Make it so delicious. The way they're cooked, or what's on top of them, or all of it. It's all of it. Um, the way they're cooked, they use some kind of mystery spice. Um, it's, yeah, the best potato skins ever, uh, the Mac Tavern. Well, thanks for playing along. I, I, and the potato one went a little bit better than I thought it would. <laughs> Go figure. Cool. So Nathan Laird, uh, first off, let's get your official, I don't know, your official like title and day gig. We don't normally start it off this way, but I feel like this is um, really relevant to where this conversation is going to be headed. Sure. So my official title is I'm the program manager for the Connector program, which is um, housed by the Halifax Partnership, which is the city of Halifax's economic development organization. So that's my job title. Um, if you like, I can kind of delve into that a little bit because that's a little bit um, vague, I would say, in terms of what my actual day to day looks like. I wasn't going to say vague. I was going to say like huge. Um, <laughs> like that's just my, uh, my, yeah. Like tell me a little bit. Well, first off, how did we get connected? And then yeah, I'd love to hear about what your day to day looks like. So I think it was actually a great example of how Halifax works and the way that we got connected. Uh, because I had met um, representatives from the CPA Association, uh, you know, who are a mutual acquaintance, and, you know, they introduced us. So, you know, for anyone listening, it's a great example in Halifax. You never know when you're going to meet someone who's going to know someone else who's going to know someone else. Um, it's one of the benefits of being in a, you know, a, a mid-sized city that we're all connected um, in so many different ways. And I find the city of Halifax are just natural connectors to begin with, you know, outside of the connector program. Completely. Okay. Now lead us in. So in terms of what my actual day-to-day -day job is, so the Connector program works with between four and 500 people per year. And it's a blend of recent graduates, um, both domestic and international, as well as recent newcomers to the city. And the program's um, sponsored by the province of Nova Scotia and RBC. And we've been in existence for about 12 years now. 
And so what we do at our heart is we help people with networking introductions. So uh, my team and I meet with everyone who comes through the program for about an hour to share any information we have about the labor market, ask about their job search, maybe some companies of interest. And then we look to introduce them to professionals in their preferred sector. So the Connector program has a database of roughly 700 um, business professionals in Halifax, ranging from people that, you know, were a few years into their career up to, you know, senior executives. And so we'll reach out with a copy of the participant's resume and essentially look to make a networking introduction. So not with the premise or the promise of an interview or a job, but rather to get to know people in your sector. And it gets that process started of building a professional network, which is going to be so valuable in your career. But often the most challenging part is how do I get going? You know, I don't mm -hmm. know anyone. I'm new to the city. Where do I begin? And that's I'm new to the city. At. I'm new to my profession. I'm changing my profession. I was an arts undergrad and then I decided to become an accounting major and oh crap, I don't have any co-op experience or blah, blah, blah. Or as marketing, then I came to the light side. Yeah. So how do I get started? How do I get started? So to get started, there's a website submission form on the Halifax Partnerships website. I, you can send the details through. It'll come to myself and I'll assign it to one of my team. Now, to participate in the program, you do have to be within four to six months away from graduation. So if you're further out than that, I encourage you to still look for networking opportunities. And when you do hit that time frame, please reach out to the Connector program. That's great, because one of the reasons why I wanted you to be on here was to kind of give people tips and tricks on what they can do now. And then what's cool is they'll come away from this and remember, oh yeah, Nathan Laird, the potato skin guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm now like six months or two years post-graduation and I want to maybe refresh my network. I want to get connected. I want to, you know, now is the time because I'm, I'm at that stage. So they can always circle back. And here, what I'm super thrilled about and why Kathleen Brown from CP Atlantic, who I had friend of the podcast, suggested that we connect is because you have the tips and tricks, uh, the charisma, the learned experience of everything I do not possess about what to do <laughs> in job interviews. I feel like we are a good foil. I can talk I about so. what not to do and you can talk about what to do um, because prior to becoming, um, uh, prior to getting your role here, uh, you came from an executive uh, recruiting firm. Is that correct? Uh, not necessarily executive. So I was managing a deco, which is one of the Fortune 500 um, global mm. staffing and recruiting companies. So I had spent uh, roughly a year managing a deco, and that was my, you know, real um, first time into managing in the recruiting space and really learning how the process works. And so, although we didn't do a lot of executive recruiting, you get to learn, you know, how recruiting is very similar across disciplines. And Absolutely. also, when you meet with a lot of people, you very, very quickly learn who stands out and what stands out, both in a positive way and in a negative way. Ooh, I, I can't wait to dig into that. So, like, when they say elevator pitch, when most of us go, Ugh, you're like, I got this. Or I know what looks good. I know what not to do. Correct? Correct. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, we do bounce around a lot here. And if I ever cut you off and you want to swing back to something, please just give me a nudge. Um, I thought maybe I'd start off with talking about how, uh, maybe what not, not to do from my point of view. So several episodes ago, I was sort of asked about the recruiting, kind of came up, the recruiting cycle. And I had a cringy like flashback to all the years ago where, you know, the companies come to you. It's nice, like in a sense that uh, the companies come to campus, <sighs> there's free food. So of course you're like, okay, I'm going to free food and jobs. I'm, I'm here for that. Um, but it was, you know, being an extrovert introvert, I found it very difficult, especially because you're surrounded by your peers who are amazing, right? Um, and you're surrounded by these people that, you know, know what's going on. And it's your job to kind of impress and get a you know, job or get like recognized. And I found that to be very tiring. Um, would you say that's typical from what you've heard? Or, or am I a special case? No, I think that's actually very typical because it is, you know, when you're in an environment like that, you're obviously looking to put your best foot forward, make a very positive first impression. Um, you're often in a room with a number of your peers who are also looking to make a very good first impression. So, no, it is, it can be very, you know, challenging and especially when this is all new and you don't really understand, you know, how to stand out. 
um, it can be really, you know, a challenge because you're going off of either what people may have told you, what you think is true, but the whole experience is new. So, you know, as you've done it more, you do start to definitely get better and better at it. I would say job searching and interviewing is certainly a learned skill. And That's comforting. <laughs> Uh, definitely the more people do it, um, and especially going through interviews and learning both how to prepare and what a lot of the common questions look like, definitely the better they will become at it. But okay. it certainly, I think, is a lot of pressure on, you know, people just going to go to school because the, off the thing that we often hear is, you know, how do I stand out amongst a group of my peers? You know, we've all got the same education, um, you know, different types of potentially employment and volunteer experience, but how do I stand out? And yeah, so, so what do you say? So I think what I um, what I honestly believe in the way I, I've done it, you know, in my own career is I look at job searching as a sales and marketing challenge. So often people think of it as, you know, it's just about finding the right job posting, sending a resume and hoping for the best. And not to say that doesn't occasionally work, but if you look at it as from a marketing perspective and really trying to understand what it's like being the recruiter on the mm -hmm. other end of one of these job postings then you can actually start to understand, I think, how to stand out. So I'm going to, you know, first talk about what it's like to be on the other end of a job posting. So for something that, you know, is applicable to a young professional or a recent graduate. So the way it typically works is, you know, your job posting closes, you get, let's say, 50 resumes. So I, you have to imagine being the recruiter who's now got a stack of at least 50 resumes, uh, more than likely more than that, uh, if it's for a recent grad role. So you've got 50 resumes, you're never going to interview 50 people. Um, if you're looking to hire one position, you're maybe going to interview four to five people as your first round. So you have to imagine, okay, how am I gonna select five people out of 50 to be my email interviews? So if you think about it from a marketing perspective, it really comes back, I think, to you know, how you're marketing yourself. And I think that comes through both a resume and a LinkedIn profile. I think they're both really good marketing tools. And in the era of job searching, you know, if we, we take networking out of the equation for the minute, then really in an area of electronic job searching, um, having a strong resume and a strong LinkedIn page, I think are crucial. And when I say a strong resume, one of the, the challenges um, I often see people run into is their resumes all look and sound the same. So the, the joke that I always talk about is the honest, reliable, hardworking, dedicated, motivated, trustworthy team player. Um, when I see a resume- Let me just put that they're like hungry. <laughs> hungry and action driven or something. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just <laughs> stand yeah. out. And now, not that a few of those, you know, terms can't be used, but I find they get overused. So mm -hmm. when you're looking at a stack of resumes and every one of them or most of them start off with some variation of, I'm an energetic recent graduate looking for a company who supports, you know, great social work and who can help fulfill my personal development. Um, you know, I'm a great team player, have good communication skills. That's so generic yeah. that... You know what, I, and I can say this from personal experience, if you're looking at 50 resumes and they all have some variation of that, then none of it stands out. It all just sounds the same. So you have to really look at, you know, and think about what is your value proposition? Mm. So when you're talking to a company, you're, you know, creating your resume and your LinkedIn, what do you have to offer a potential employer? And you have to be able to back up what you're talking about with examples. So lots of people say, for example, they have great attention to detail but then their resume is full of grammar and spelling mistakes and poorly formatted. So- And that's to, not trying to be ironic. They're like, <laughs> just checking to see if you have great attention to detail. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes people will get very gimmicky on their resumes and they'll use self-ranking systems. So on Excel, I'm an eight out of 10 um, and you know, so on. I find those really don't work that well either. There's no scale, like there's, there's no reference point. There's not. And yeah. again, you know, um, how accurate is, you know, a self um, a self analysis, sometimes very good, but it's no recruiter is going to look at that and be wowed. Um, yeah. So you have to look at, in my opinion, what are really the hard skills that you can, you know, not only say about yourself, but back up with an example. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, what I found in my career early on is it's a matter of looking for opportunities to build your resume. And whether that's looking for volunteer opportunities, 
um, you know, engaging with the CPA, if you're looking to get into, you know, the accounting profession, you have to start to build up what you can offer an employer. Because if you're graduating and your main selling point is that I have a degree, that's great. But there's hundreds of other people that, you know, have that exact same selling point. So I think early on looking for opportunities to build your resume and build the skills that you can offer an employer. Perfect. So if I were to sum that up, something that kind of came to mind is evidence-based recruiting, the tactic, right? So, you know, the show, don't tell, right? right? Provide enough to provide a spark of interest and then be ready. You know, if you say... I don't even know. You have so many good like catchphrases. I'm just trying to think about, you know, when I think about my last like resume or my CV, it's all things I've done versus, you know, an accomplishment. So it'll be like, you know, um, let him manage a team of over 500 contractors for a, you know, multi-million dollar project over the span of eight weeks, you know, things like that. Um, mm-hmm. And then perhaps I could, you know, if there was a bullet point, it would say something like, uh, you know, get stuff done under, <laughs> under, see, this is why I'm so bad of it. Um, but you're just saying, so maybe lead with a few key accomplishments because our grads are awesome. They've had at least three co-op terms where they've been full out and it's, it's rigorous. There's standards uh, that must be met with our management career services. So they come out with over a year of experience, professional experience. And I've had friends hire current students and recent recent uh, grads from like from my program from our program I've hired uh, recent grads and students and I have to say like I am overall really impressed with their ability to be professionals not just act like professionals but like be professionals and bring that skill set so what you're saying is perhaps instead of saying um you know instead of telling all of these keywords and buzzwords but listing a few of those key accomplishments right up at the top is that correct that is absolutely correct. Accomplishments will always stand out more than, you know, day-to-day job duties. Now, I think, you know, to properly market yourself, you can focus on both. But I think you want to make the reader um, think, wow, that's impressive. So as they're looking at your resume and going line by line, try and give them that wow moment. And if the, the students listening to this, you know, have had three co-ops, that's a huge, huge asset because right there, you've got significant amount of professional experience that you can talk about. But even, you know, for people that don't have, you know, aren't fortunate enough to have a co-op, I would say, you know, if you've had, um, like me, you know, back when I was going to school, you had a series of random summer jobs, you know, on either retail or food service mm-hmm. or Um, you know, warehouse type work. So if you were doing random work for the summer, still think about, you know, what did, what were your actual accomplishments? Mm. And to give you a great example, I've been um, working with someone who um, is a recent grad from Mount St. Vincent um, with an arts degree and had, you know, in her early twenties had worked eight years at Tim Hortons. So when we first started talking about how to market her experience, um, she had listed almost half a page of duties on essentially what a Tim Hortons counter attendant does. Mm -hmm. And so what I had to tell her was, you know, everyone who's, um, you know, went to a Tim Hortons is very familiar with what one of their workers does. You don't need to spend that much time talking about your day-to-day duties, but talk about, you know, how the fact that you've trained new employees, Um, that, you know, you've worked for the same company, you know, in a service industry with high turnover for eight years, Mm. you know, that's a significant accomplishment. So don't talk about, you know, greeting customers and counting the till talk about training and new employees and, you know, spending eight years with one company in a high turnover profession. Completely, completely. I was responsible for the file organization management system right? I filed Mm -hmm. stuff um, during my first uh, co-op thing. So what I'm hearing here is that instead of saying what you did, say how you did, say why you did it, say why that relates and really just hammering home versus maybe you start with that list. Maybe you start with, you know, that you were, you know, you worked at the front and then you worked your way back to the back and then you, you have all that list for yourself. And then you sit back and you're like, okay, how does this relate? How did these you know, these tools and these accomplishments, how do they transfer to the jobs that I'm targeting or like the opportunities that I'm targeting and then list them out as accomplishments? Is that, is that fair? That's a hundred percent accurate. Okay. 
Because again, if you know um, the listeners imagine being the recruiter on the other end, yeah. if you look at someone's resume, you know, out of this stack of we'll say bland resumes, and someone's talking about you know the accomplishments they had, um, whether it's you know in a, the related profession or not, I promise you that will absolutely stand out. And I also encourage just because you know um, I'm guessing a lot of Dal folks will be listening to this. Mm-hmm. If you have not um, visit uh, the School of Management Career Services team. They oh yes, incredible work! I can't. Yes. Um, I know fantastic. Robert very well. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah. are doing. They, this it's like day. mandatory. They don't get out of first year without have, and they have slick resumes. Like it looks good. So oh, that's great that you are you are connected with Robert. I I'm not surprised. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm definitely a fan of the work that Robert and his yeah. team do. And I see it, you know, and I've seen it consistently for four years that people who engage with career services, whether it's at, you know, the School of Management or where other people are, are attending university or post-secondary, you are better prepared. Um, the people who right. are working in those um, departments are really good and they're engaged with industry to know what stands out and, you know, wh- who's growing at any given time. Completely. And then just the more people, the more people in positions that you have experience in the jobs that you want, or, you know, are there themselves, the more people that look at your resume um, and that can provide you feedback, maybe on your approach, like all these little tips are kind of like confetti. Um, They're almost, or like a big buffet and you can kind of like pick up one or two things or a few things along the way. And it always adds, right. You bring it into your context. Now I have to say, when you said (laughs) a stack of resumes and something came up for anybody that's familiar with Legally Blonde, um, I just, there was a reference. It's like, it's pink and it's scented. <laughs> so what are your thoughts? Uh, just silly question um, to make your resume stand out. What are some things not to do? How do you not want to make it stand out? You know, aside from the typos and being maybe dirty or sloppy or saying final draft, 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 and like the heading, like what are the like things that maybe aren't so obvious um, for pink and scented? Is that okay? Uh it depends. Um, I haven't seen a pink and scented resume lately because they all come through email these days. So you lose yeah. the scent. Um, I would say there's a few things. Now, actually, going back to a point you just made, Sam, um, I actually would be careful about asking everyone for mm. opinion on your resume. Um, you know, Robert and his team do great work. But what I have found over the years, and this is in my own career as well, Mm -hmm. that not everyone necessarily understands what constitutes a strong resume. Now, what I have found is everyone has opinions on what Mm. constitutes a strong resume. And but I've seen some people that have actually gotten um, questionable advice. Uh, So I think you do have to be cautious in terms of who you're, you know, soliciting resume advice from, because not everyone and certain people are very good with certain, you know, industries. Um, So, you know, an engineering resume is very different than an accounting one is very different than um, an IT one. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for allowing me to clarify. I'm more meant the people that have been in the roles that you want, meaning they've been hiring for the roles that you want. Yes. And like the management career services, like never feel like you're bothering management career services and never feel like, oh, well, I went there once in first year. I shouldn't go there again. No, you should like keep going. Like they want to see you. They want to help. They want to be part of your journey. So yeah, thanks for letting me clarify that. (laughs) Don't just like post it to a Google doc and tell people like, have at her. (laughs) Exactly. Um, now going back to your other question. Yeah. So what are some things, some ways to stand out in a negative way? In my opinion? Yeah. What not so I find often people are told um, to strictly keep their resume to either one or two pages. Mm. And so sometimes to accommodate those um, space limits, self-imposed space limits, they'll end up reducing the font, shrinking the margins down. So I would strongly encourage people not to do that. Um, In my experience, use an 11 or 12 point font, white space on your resume is good. Mm -hmm. Uh, And don't- Why is it good? Why is it good? It's, again, it makes it easier to read. Mm -hmm. So when you have that stack of resumes and you're flipping through them, um, it's actually very true that you get about 10 to 15 seconds of a recruiter's eye time um, to make an initial impression. Yeah. And if something is has very small font and you know shrunk margins, um, no white space, it becomes really hard to read. And yeah. so the reader is instinctively going to you know not invest as much time because it, essentially it feels overwhelming. 
Completely. Uh, when you get something that's very compressed. Now, what I would say is, you know, as you advance further in your career, I think it's perfectly acceptable to have a resume that's three, three and a half pages. I think unless you're an engineer, you have to get careful going ever beyond four. But I, the rule that I always tell people is look at how much, you know, interesting content that you have and use as much space as you need to properly sell your experience. And, you know, I think you should take a look at a re your resume before you submit it to a job with a critical eye, go line by line and say, is this actually telling the reader something interesting or is this filling in space? <clears throat> and have an honest discussion, because if you're just filling in space, um, it's probably, you know, you cut out, you know, some of the excess information. So the counterpoint, though, is like, oh, but it's all good stuff. I have all this good stuff. It's like maybe just pick the best stuff because if, it could take away from all your really good stuff. If it's, you know, you have to really, you know, ask yourself the question, is it all good stuff? And maybe it is. And, you know, in certain cases, if you're looking and you say, yeah, I think every one of these points I have is, you know, every one of my 18 points. You know, there it does come a time where of uh, diminishing return, um, where again, you know, if you try and get too much information, you can distract away from the really important points. We're dealing with accountants mostly, primarily. So I just want to make sure I go back to my audience. It's like we like numbers, we like a range. What would a good range, like a, a safer range, be from what somebody could reasonably accomplish in say a four to eight month term? Would you say like three to five bullet points of like good quality accomplishments? Yeah, I think three to five for, you know, one particular role that was about that length would be um, like probably the target. most you could come up with. I think if you were to come up with, you know, 10 or 12 points out of, you know, a, a shorter role, you're probably stretching it a little bit. So, yeah, I think three to five really solid, impressive, you know, bullet points um, per position would be good. Okay. And again, and I'm sorry to put this in a box. I absolutely agree with you. It's experience-based. It's, you know, that, you know, put yourself in the other shoes, but for us, like people that may be like, Oh my gosh, like I'm starting fourth year. There's all this recruiting stuff. Like, give me a number, just give me a number. <laughs> so like, I, anyways, I just wanted to like, you know, why, um, why I'm kind of pounding back on that. Okay, all good. So what and else I not to do? So, and just one point too, um, and where you just said, give me a number that actually leads into another great point. <laughs> yeah. So I find, especially with um, either professionals or students or graduates who have, you know, um, finance and accounting backgrounds and experience include some numbers. Yeah. Nothing stands out worse to me in a bad way for accountants. It, when I look at a resume that's two or three pages long and I don't see a single number. Mm. Because if you've been working in your profession and there's no numbers as an accountant, I wonder why. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, for anyone that's going into accounting, the more that you can use numbers to illustrate some of, you know, the projects you were on, the scope of them, the success of them, that, those are the details that will absolutely stand out. Part of the evidence-based self-marketing. I like this. Yes. Show me, don't tell me. Great. So yeah, um, I going back to what I mentioned. So use an 11 or 12 point font, keep one inch margins um, all around and you know, go with the required, whatever length that makes your resume, go with that length. So I would say for you know, a recent graduate, you're probably not going to go much beyond two, two and a half pages at most. Um, if you're beyond that, I would say, unless you've you know, had a career before you came to you know, school right. at Dell, then you, you know, as a recent grad with, you know, random job experience and some co-ops, I'd say probably two, two and a half pages is where your resume would want to fall. I uh, don't use Times New Roman font. Again, it's actually hard on the eyes. Um, I would suggest using Arial, Calibri, or Tahoma. Um, very easy to read. Um, pleasing on the eye. So, and that's a very simple one, but one that often people make mistakes on. Uh, another tip is, when you want to bring attention to something, pick either one of bold, italics, or underline. Mm. I would say using bold is the way that I would suggest going. What sometimes you see is people that will use bold on some things, bold and italics on others, underline other things, and it ends up being sort of messy looking. So I would say pick one of the three that you want to use to bring attention to something and go with that one consistently top to bottom on your resume. But I think bold is the most pleasing to the eye and stands yeah. out the best. 
Okay, now I, I need a little bit of tea. I need some dirt. I need some anonymized, of course. But like, what's one of the things that when you read it on a, a resume, you were like, no, <laughs> or just like, or, or maybe laughed out loud for the wrong reasons, or just, I, I need a little bit of like entertainment here. You've read a lot, so there should be some good ones. Well, I, I could tell you lots of examples, but there's actually one that sticks out in my head. Um, there's actually two um, that stick out in my head that I'll, I'll give examples of. Uh, one of them actually is a Dalhousie alumni. Um, I, I don't remember the person's name or program, but I do remember they were from Dal. So on this particular resume, they had used um, a ranking system for themselves to rank different skills, but they also um, listed out hobbies. And so the hobbies that were listed on, one of the hobbies that was listed on this individual's resume was vodka. Um, <laughs> And this wasn't someone, you know, who had grew up in, in Russia and, you know, had, was like a, a vodka sommelier, whatever they're called. This was just a recent grad um, who at 22 listed vodka as one of his hobbies. Not uh, lying. <laughs> not a, All right, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So, yeah, I, that one always stood out to me for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know that what employer would ever look at that and be like, that's our guy. Um, yeah. He's the one we want to interview. <laughs> <You're not. laughs> Found you. So that definitely stood out for the wrong reasons. Um, someone else, I've seen this a number of times, but using unprofessional email addresses. Yes. Uh, definitely stands out for the wrong reason. So, you know, I would say anyone listening to this. No, they're uh, good. They're, they're good. good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, we're, we can go, go right back to the <laughs> Anything stand out for the right reasons? Like that you were just like, oh, that was, you know, something that maybe, you know, you provided so many good tips already, but just something that was very unique and that you go back to time and time again, when you're providing examples to people, um, like the one with the, the, um, the Tim Hortons professional that went on, mm -hmm. like, that was excellent. It's, I've seen a lot of really strong resumes over the years. Um, I think that it's not one thing that typically makes a good one. It really is a, a combination of the things we've been discussing. Yeah. Uh, I have seen some, in terms of the format people use, I have seen some, uh, people that have marketing and, uh, public relations backgrounds, come up with a bit more of a graphic format for their resume. Um, and I have seen some of those work really well. So I think it's something you have to be very careful with because very quickly you can get into something that's gimmicky, which I think is bad. But in terms of the template, I've seen some, you know, typically business professionals, we use much more of a traditional template and, you know, which career services would use. Uh, and I think that's always a safe way to go. Yeah. Stand but, out for the right reasons or be solid, you know, do all the things right, especially for, you know, your first gig post-grad, um, you know, and kind of do all that, avoid all the bad things and then kill it on all the networking. Um, do you think it's time we can move on to the networking? Yeah, let's move on to networking. Okay. So I'll tell you how I did it um, and what I told them before so that you can say what was wrong with that because there's a lot. And then we can go on and um, I kind of want to hit on you know, if we have those in-person socials, if they have online socials and just kind of various permutations and combinations, because we're really living in the wild, wild west as far as what recruiting could look like this fall. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was like, sweet, free food, but I was like, no, I'm here for jobs, not free food, but I, I also want the free food. So I would go and, you know, business professional. So something that I was comfortable in, I didn't, you know, wear heels because I could fall. But if you're cool with heels, do heels, like just something you feel comfortable in that you would wear to an interview. I went and I didn't, I, I knew that I did not have the energy to stay like all night. And you never want to be that person that's there till like the end, but you also don't want to, you're there for a reason. So I was like, I have the energy for three, three people because you have to, I don't know if it's still like this, but there's like circles where like, there's like the person and then like the people that want to talk to the person. And so they're placed strategically around the room. So I targeted my people, one old, one young and one in between. And I would stand in the circle, like side, I would, you know, like encourage the other person. And then I would, you know, interrupt because that's all interrupting. It's just like, you know, that joke, like knock, knock, who's there interrupting move, right? Like that's, that's essentially like all of us. So laugh, like, haha, like encourage other people, um, you know, ask them a question, provide something about myself, you know, then keep talking about, you know, this and that. And then I would like 
Thank you so much. Oh, I have to, you know, I have to go for a moment. Like, thank you so much. Great to talk with you. Um, my name's, you know, Sam Taylor, la, 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 you know, and just repeat that kind of fun fact or that thing that we talked about. I hope you have a great evening. Hopefully I got a business card or something and I would take it away. And then I would go run to the bathroom and I would just sit there like, okay, okay, that's one down. It's one down, you know, put in the information in my card, go out, food, again, walk to the washroom, make sure I have nothing in my face, and then rinse, repeat. I could do that three times, go home, back into my, like, little extrovert, introvert cubby, and be done. Tell me what was, I don't know, good, if there was anything, and then what could be improved to make it a better, more memorable <laughs> um, for the positive uh, experience? I think, I mean, what you did is exactly what I would tell people to do. It's what I do myself. Oh, so. <laughs> Yeah, no, it really, because a lot of people listen to this, you know, just like you said, you know, an extroverted introvert, um, I'm the same way. So, you know, a lot, I get asked a lot, you know, I'm not an outgoing person. I'm not an extrovert. How can I network? And so everyone should be aware that if you ask, you know, prof business professionals, who's really comfortable networking, it's about a 50, 50 split in my experience. Oh. Um, you know, there are definitely the type A outgoing people. There's all kinds of people, including myself, who are much more introverted, but push yourself out of that comfort zone. I, know, yeah, I never would have thought that you are an extrovert introvert as well. So that's cool. Yeah, no, I'm extremely introverted, you know, in my private life. And even when I first got this job, um, my girlfriend had said to me, <laughs> and this is a direct quote, why do they hire you? You're the most antisocial person I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man you're like so, uh, that that's at home <laughs> professionally <laughs> yeah exactly so oh. everyone should take that away that you know what yeah. you don't have to be that you know outgoing person 24 7 it's you know you can work to you know bring yourself out of you know your comfort zone when you go to some of these events yeah but, and stretching is and getting outside your comfort zone it's nice to learn and experience um and especially it's all, it's a high risk, but it's also a low risk environment because most of the people who've been on the other, who are on the other side have been in your shoes. Oh, and, for sure. you know, if they aren't bringing, you know, some sort of kindness and empathy, that's also a really good signal for that whole two-way interview process, right? If somebody's there to like exert their power and make you feel like shit, I would probably, you know, really think twice if that's the company that you want to be a part of, Right. Even if you stutter and mumble and spill things on yourself and them, like it's okay. It's all good. It is. And I have very, you know, rarely ever seen that happen where someone Please. takes that approach. Now, not to say it couldn't happen because. No, but I'm just, these are the fears. These are yep. the illogical fears that you're like, I got <laughs> it. So we, we got to get the fear monster out of the closet. So the great thing, you're right. I mean, everyone has been in that position where you're either new to a city, you're new to the workforce, new to, you know, a particular profession. So I've really found people are, you know, really good at that, but we've all been there. And, you know, a lot of networking interactions are very similar. So once you've, you know, gone to a couple of events, you've talked to a few people, it's often, you know, very similar types of conversations you're having. But I do have some great tips that I can Please. give. So, you know, we're coming into a time, it looks like this fall, there's going to be a lot more opportunities to network in person. So biggest thing I would say first is look for opportunities to get out there. Hmm. Uh, we've all been using LinkedIn and Zoom for the last year and a half. I find people are getting Zoomed out now, but I think there's going to be a lot of um, anticipation and desire to get out to meeting people in person again. So, you know, look at um, websites like Eventbrite, you know, check the Halifax Partnership, the Chamber of Commerce, and look for events that are coming up this fall and get out there and meet people. Because oh, and the Dow. So like for the Dow people here, um, you know, look at your MCS, like watch the job boards, watch yeah. the event centers, like internally too. Absolutely. And the great thing with in-person events is often the person that you're dying to talk to, you know, through LinkedIn, you know, the president of the company, a VP, your dream, you know, kind of meeting, they're at these networking events. And you know what, when you see people at a networking event, it is 100% fair game to go up and talk to them. So it doesn't matter if you're finishing university and you want to go talk to the CEO, if you're at the same event, go do it. Mm. Um, so that's, you know, and again, people that you'd never be able to get meetings with, you know, messaging through LinkedIn. If you come out to an Halifax Partnership event or a Chamber event or a DAL event, you'll see them there. That's great. So yeah, don't limit yourself to just the DAL events. Go out and, you know, 
volunteer or go out and go to those event rights and yeah I like it and then when your name does pop up later it's not a bad thing cool that's really good way to get around the system yeah and I think you know approaching networking that taking a genuine interest in getting to know the other person is yeah. probably the biggest thing that I can stress that if you go and you meet someone new and you just put a hard push on that, you know, I'm about to graduate. I really need an interview. Are you guys? I need a job. (laughs) I need a job. That's if you imagine being the other, you know, that person who's receiving that message, um, you know, the person hasn't even asked, said hello, you know, kind of gotten to know me at all. They're just saying, look, can you hire me? Yeah. And if not moving on, take it, take the approach of, you know, genuinely getting to know someone, you know, you're early on in your career, you've got a lengthy ways to go. Um, you know, look at it as building a long-term relationship. And nice. the thing with networking is, and especially in person, you never know when you're going to meet the one person who's going to make a real impact on your career. But the more people you meet, you know, we've all had that person or multiple people in our career that have made an impact. The more that you network, the greater the odds you're going to meet that person sooner than later. Yes. So that actually brings us to why my strategy was not the best in the sense that I limited to three. What? Well, <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily a bad strategy. It's what you're comfortable with. And, mm. you know, it's setting an attainable goal. And yes. I always encourage people when you go to an event, actually set a number of people that you would like to talk to and not just your group of friends that you may go with. But so whether it's three people- Well, oh, that's time, actually, sorry, that's actually really important. So I never went with any of these um, with friends, partly because I didn't have a ton in university. I, <laughs> I, I played sports and I worked. So when I went to school, I like, I went to school. I had a few, but I like, they weren't anyways, had no, I just had no friends. So basically I had nobody to go to interview and networking events with. <laughs> um, but if for people here that do, um, would you suggest to go with your friends so you feel more comfortable or would you suggest a different strategy? I think sometimes going with your friends um, for the comfort level isn't a bad idea. But when you actually get to the event, I think, you know, going off on your own, uh, you know, don't look to network as a duo uh, or a trio. (laughs) (laughs) And I I do find sometimes people are a little bit nervous. And so they'll just hang out with the group of people they went with, but it really defeats the purpose. So, you know, I would suggest go with people that, you know, you know, it's always good to have a friend there. But when you do get to an event, you know, don't hesitate to go out and do your own things individually. Smart. Okay. I'm sorry. I know I cut you off there. I just, I, I, something that never came up for me because it wasn't, it wasn't something I had to deal with. Um, Another good tip I'll say, and this one, you know, it's sort of common sense, but not always. Mm. And that if you're at a networking event, really understand your alcohol tolerance. Um, You know, I get often asked, is it okay to have a drink at a networking event? And so this is my answer to that because it's an, you know, it will happen. So when my team and I are go to networking events, um, we follow a strict two drink limit uh, because, you know, there's nothing wrong from a social sense with having a drink, Mm -hmm. but you never want to be the person. And I've seen a few of them um, who really go over the edge. And then you're at a networking event, making a terrible first impression on a lot of people. So I think be, you know, now understand your personal tolerance and you know what, uh, whether you should have anything to drink. And even if you think you've got a great tolerance, um, you don't want to go to a networking event trying to push it. Uh, so, you know, a social drink is okay, but I would really know when to draw the line. Don't make that, you know, the lasting impression. And I could actually go into stories here. I'm not going to, but of people it, that- It was probably that vodka guy. <laughs> it wasn't actually. Um, <laughs> no, don't worry, offline, offline. It'll yes. be maybe part, part two. Uh, I definitely do also have those stories uh, and it, it was very fortunate for me that it happened at my first networking event um, from somebody in the later year and it was like a very good example of what not to do and that kind of has stuck with me so yeah I think and is it okay not to drink? Absolutely. Okay. Um, personally I'll often just go with water when I'm at a networking event because in my job I'm talking a lot yes. uh, when I'm at networking events so you know, I find it better just to drink water. And I even choose, and this is only a personal choice, but I don't even eat when I'm at an event Mm. because I'm always paranoid about having something in my teeth or trying to carry on a conversation as I'm chewing. So um, typically I just will drink water and that's it. But again, that's only a personal um, decision. Nothing that I would say people have to follow. 
And, but does it look weird or bad if you don't eat or if you seem a little, you know, pickish, like, you know what I mean? Like, does that come off poorly? Um, I don't necessarily think so. Uh, no, I most so people either. I would say, honestly, at event, most people at networking events do eat. So I would be the outlier. I would say the fact that I don't eat. Mm-hmm. Um, so but nobody, again, nobody's like pointing it out or, you know, like it's not a weird thing. And I, I just say this because there's so many, gosh, you Google anything and there's like opinion pieces about drink, don't drink, make it look like you're drinking. Don't talk about your drinking, like eat, don't eat, eat this, not that, like just all these rules. And I think what I'm hearing from you is like, all of that is okay, but just know you and know what makes you feel good and remember what your objective is. And if that fits in your objective, cool. And if it doesn't, don't do it. Is that pretty much a good summary? Yeah, I think that's a perfect summary. You know, know yourself and again, what you're trying to accomplish going to an event and keep that in in focus. And again, whether it's drinking, not drinking, um, eating, not eating, it it really is a personal preference. Now, one other point I'll just make on, you know, again, why um, another reason I choose not to eat is in my experience at a lot of events, you're, and especially before COVID happened, um, you would constantly be shaking hands and exchanging business cards. So I always like to have a glass of water um, because my throat does dry out. So the glass of water was always in my left hand and I was always keeping my right hand open um, to either shake or swap cards. So that was another little piece of it. But again, it's whatever whatever the individual would like to do. Um, you're not going to be judged either way. No. And what's really cool is I kind of think of these things as like, oh, it's like real life where everybody's on their best be- or should be on their best behavior. Right. So it's like just understanding what your objective is and that, you know, it's not a five hour marathon. It's probably a one to two hour getting to know a few people, getting to know them outside of like what their daily role is. And if something comes up like, oh, well, how do you manage your, I don't know, Olympic speed cycling, you know, career with your job? Like how, like, how does that work? Or, you know, if it kind of is a tangent related to it. Um, I would also probably say just the obvious topics to stay away from are how much money do you make? What is your position? Um, what are other not so obvious things? Maybe like how long have you been there? That might not, unless it comes up from like a follow-up question, not, or, or tell me if I'm wrong or right, because I am, I've had one interview in the last like 10 years. I had the most interviews for Red Lobster, um, Mm -hmm. more than I did for EY, right? Because I, I played rugby and I played sports and that ended up just coming up in all of the networking events and something that kind of came up because, you know, team player, but, um, you know, for those not to do things is like, it's hard, right? It's kind of hard to know the spectrum. So any questions not to ask or good ones to ask? I think certainly the salary one is a good one to avoid. Uh, (laughs) Uh, yeah, just not good etiquette, you know, to ask someone in your first <laughs> meeting how much money they make. Um, what kind of car know. do you drive? Yeah. Any what of kind that of car type of... should I drive? Yeah. <laughs> I'd probably avoid those. I don't yeah. know that necessarily asking someone how long they've been at an organization mm-hmm. is uh, necessarily a bad thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, something I think that is actually a good thing to do is, you know, understanding when you're going in, if there are certain people or organizations you're interested in connecting with. So again, setting that list, you know, maybe it is EY or Deloitte or Grant Thornton, then browsing through their website and understanding some of their recent headlines, what's going on. Because if you want a way to make a great first impression, let's say it is Grant Thornton, just for um, sure, argument's yeah. sake. That if you're, you know, talking to Blair Thompson, who's one of the Grant Thornton recruiters, and you say, well, I just noticed, you know, you're really building your professional services division, or you've been hiring a lot in assurance or audit, um, or I noticed that you just got this contract. If you can actually show that you, you know, you're familiar with what's going on with the company, that's one simple way that you can really stand out. So, you know, if there are organizations you're really interested in, stay on top of them. Because if you do get to network and talk to someone from one of those, especially if it's, you know, someone in a management director, VP level position, it's a great way to separate yourself from the crowd that, you know, Mm -hmm. showing that you're already engaged with their business and you're not even working for them. Completely. Oh, I'm just so curious now. Okay. Questions. Um, Using, because people like to provide their opinions and advice. If you feel comfortable at a networking event, would it be appropriate to say, hey, 
when you were in my position, like what, you know, when you were recruiting, what, what things helped you stand out or feel comfortable or what attracted you to the employer that you went to first? And was that your, you know, blah, 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 this company that they're with, is that kind of appropriate to kind of almost, almost make them an ally during that meeting? Yeah, I think so. You know, asking if they know, you know, what, um, you know, what qualities really stand out for that company. Uh, a great tip, you know, kind of related to that is asking someone, you know, what would advice would you give to someone in my position? Yeah. Uh, an easy kind of networking tip that everyone can take away is if you need, ask someone to talk about themselves. People <laughs> love to talk about themselves. So, yeah, you know, asking, do you have any advice you would give to someone in my position? Um, you know, what path did you take to get to where yeah. you're at in your organization? Um, that's a great one because there you're asking people to tell you about their background and people will just talk your ear off. Absolutely. And honestly, it's interesting because I want to know that. I want to know like what their thought process was to make them go through that because it's, you know, maybe it seems like strategic, but it's just flipping interesting. And then you can follow their thought process. And if that's something that aligns with your values, that helps you kind of pre-interview the company, right? If this is who they're sending and you don't vibe with what they have going on, like this, because in theory, right, they should be sending the best representatives to come talk to you. And if it's not meshing or if it's, or if you mesh better somewhere else, you know, something that came up with Kathleen and that I really want to make sure I bring up here and see your opinion, but it's interviewing is a two-way process right? And networking is a two-way process. So you are also providing evidence of yourself, but you're also collecting evidence to make sure it's a fit for you. What are your thoughts about that? I completely agree with that. Because really for, you know, an employer-employee relationship to be successful long-term, it does have to be a fit on both sides. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, people can discount, you know, is this going to be a good fit for me? Because especially when you're just coming out of school, you're looking to get, you know, into your profession. So you may not have the luxury of being able to kind of pick and choose, is this the exact best fit? Or you may not have as many options as you do further on in your career. But I think you should absolutely, you know, vet the employer as much as they're vetting you. Um, yeah. You have to look at it that, you know, you're going to be whatever organization hires you, you're going to be, you know, an asset to them. And so it is, you know, you're the next generation um, who's, you know, coming along in a very tight labor market. So as much as, you know, sometimes you think it's, I just need to press the company to get my first job. They should be trying to impress you too. Um, Two-way match, right? <laughs> Two-way match. It's a, it's a play on the three-way match for uh, all the auditors out there. I'm sorry. I got to slip in like the audit jokes along the way. Um, no, that's, that's really, really nice to kind of triangulate that information because it, it feels like this weird power dynamic where it's the job holders and the job seekers, but it really is that values match that investment because in your twenties, um, I really do feel like you're spending your greatest investment should be how do I spend my time? How do I set myself up? How do I gather as much skills and have as many allies to help me help as many people down the line and in the future and build a career that, you know, I don't feel, I don't feel like it's work, right? There's not like a work Sam and a fun Sam or, you know, like, it's just, it's, you have to do cool shit with cool people, right? Like that's, and that's exciting. And if you learn lots of tools along the way and like develop your skill set, then you can choose on how to employ that later on and finding those people who, who do want you to succeed. So maybe it's a little wishy-washy, but you're more powerful than you think. It's very true. Um, and yeah, especially, you know, the further you advance into your career, you know, if you get your designation, then, you know, very quickly, the power shifts primarily into, you know, the job seekers favor. Uh, Cause once you, you know, you hit a certain level of experience and, you know, your credentials, uh, you become a very, very marketable um, commodity, we'll say. So very quickly, very quickly, the dynamic does actually shift in the job seeker's favor. And then it actually, I find, becomes more of a question of managing your career versus, you know, often it's the initial, how do I get my first job? How do I get my designation? But the greater long-term challenge by far, I think, is how do you manage your career? And, you know, when you come to forks in the roads, trying to, you know, make the best decision each time. Oh, that is a whole nother podcast. Maybe. Yeah, that's another one. <laughs> but, but to that point, I was uh, out for coffee with a friend and um, like universities are fabulous. I love my position. I love where I'm at. Uh, so, and it's not a, but it's an, and, 
Um, and you're responsible to the greater public. So your expenses and what gets authorized is under a different lens than a for-profit company. So when I'm out uh, for coffee with like one of my friends, she's in a new role and it's in a different city with very expensive parking. And I was like, oh, we talked about commuting or something. And she's like, oh yeah, like I, I parking. And I was like, oh, sweet. Like, you know, that's great. And she just like stopped and looked and was like, if I didn't, I wouldn't take this job. <laughs> like I'm at a point in my career. <laughs> and she went on, I was like, well, of course. Like, meanwhile, I just dropped like $1,600 to park the, the, side <laughs> of the building. And I'm okay with that. Like it's a trade-off and you really have to figure out what your value fit and what the whole package is for you. But I love that. I love that she's like, you know, because that's that world, that's that for-profit entity. And that's, a, you know, a signal in a part of like the respect package. And that's part of the norms and culture that, you know, executives get fancy, <laughs> fancy <laughs> underground parking as a part of their perk. And I'm like, cool. Like I, I'm done with that. So yeah, very interesting when you talk about how quickly it shifts to that, <laughs> that like values role management of career, as well as all the fun stuff that comes with it, you know? What's better than being at a dinner where somebody else picks up the tab? Being that person to pick up the tab and expense it back to the company, right? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely the best part. And, you know, it does, it's, you know, anyone listening to this, you do get to that point in your career. And I so. think, you know, in the accounting profession, probably sooner than a lot of other professions. Absolutely. It's part I, of that investment. It's part of that ROI from that investment. Okay, hey, Nathan. Just a few more things. Um, before first, before we shift gears, uh, just a moment. Is there anything else on the, you know, the, the networking or the straight up um, interviewing? I feel like I feel like really wanted to hit home on the networking, um, just because like. Uh, I'm rusty. Everybody else is rusty. Like there haven't been many networking events. This is like the first go for a lot of people. Anything to kind of close out that portion here before I, I take you this in a slightly different direction. Um, I would just say, again, you know, keep it in mind, looking at your job search as a sales process and really thinking about how you want to market yourself and your experience. One point I did forget to mention before, Sam, is because uh, I think people listening to this could be either looking at public sector or private sector employment. And I just wanted to quickly touch on, you know, the differences in Please. the process and, you know, networking into the public versus private sector. So if you're looking to get into the public sector, so, you know, working for the CRA, possibly, you know, the provincial or municipal governments, it is very difficult to network your way into government work. Um, government tries to be very transparent in how they hire. So I think 50 years ago in Nova Scotia, you, did, you needed a friend, a family member who worked in government to help you get in. Now they don't want that at all. So government is very transparent. So if you're applying to a government role, the best advice I can give is look at each criteria listed on the job posting and address that. So even if it's something as simple as Microsoft Office, which I'm guessing anyone graduating with an accounting degree can use, you can't just um, leave it to someone inferring that you know how to use it. You actually have to specify it. So, um, yeah, with government roles, there really isn't an ability to network into it. Uh, it doesn't mean you shouldn't, you know, still network with people who work in government, you know, learn about how the hiring processes work, just, you know, building up your overall network. But don't think that you need an in uh, to get a job with government because you don't. You just have to go through the process. Go through the process. No, that's that's great. And also, um, just something with the CRA, I've had many, many students over the years. Um, they do a lot of off-cycle hiring, and more more of the firms are doing that as well. So, you know, I just want to briefly, I should have said this way before, but if you don't get a quote job for post-graduation, meaning if you don't get a job for October 2022, uh, by October 2021, it is okay. You will be fine. You will be fine. Like just stay, stay eye on the prize, like do well in school, have a good fourth year. You know, it's, it's okay. Cause there's lots of off cycle hiring. Uh, absolutely. And we're, I think going to be coming into a really, really, really favorable labor market in Halifax. Uh, Continue this I think to be in a really favorable labor market. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, we've gotten so much global recognition for how we've handled COVID that Halifax came into the pandemic, you know, with record population growth, GDP growth. And, you know, we took the same, we, you know, we went through the same experience everyone else did, 
but during that time, we were recognized by the New York Times, by several you know, global outlets on how we've handled COVID. And that has been noticed by companies that we talk to. So um, that was actually part of my job. I forgot to mention, Sam, is I often work with investment attraction, uh, talking to new companies coming into Nova Scotia or considering Halifax. <laughs> on Any big the- names that you can share or, or maybe just sectors that maybe we aren't aware of yet? Any breaking news? Uh, Nothing I can share that's not already out there in the public. But I mean, we worked, um, you know, during COVID with Access Capital, uh, CPQI, a number of IT companies, uh, Shopify, um, now Amazon. So, you know, Halifax does have a really good buzz. And the key sectors I find that are really growing, obviously, Ocean's Technology is one, the IT sector, but financial services is... Mm. Um, and that's between, you know, the, the consulting firms, the accounting firms, the banks, just private industry. Yeah. Um, everyone needs accountants, controllers, comptrollers, CFOs, directors of finance. So, yeah, I think, you know, anyone that's got that type of um, that has an accounting, we'll say designation or, you know, getting the degree is going to be in a very favorable position uh, coming out in the next few years. Fabulous. OK, thank you. The direction I want to take this is, it sounds like everything has always gone right for you. You, you know, manage a lot. I know you're laughing, but we're, we're, I, I just, it looks too shiny, too perfect. You've seen all these resumes. You've been, you know, overseeing uh, hundreds, if not thousands of staff at ADECO. You, um, I believe before that you were very, um, had a successful sales and marketing career at Xerox. Is this correct? Uh, yes and no. Oh, um, well, hold on. So the marketing, cause you always bring things back to marketing. So, um, and did I, did I get sale? I, it's not Xerox, is it? I got that wrong. No, it actually is Xerox. Okay, okay. But... Sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll let you correct me in a moment. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, and you say sales and marketing and it's, you know, it comes off so super well and you're like, you're very well spoken and you have all this great advice and all these accomplishments and you're lifting up people throughout your career. Has it always come this easy for you? Uh, No, (laughs) the simple answer. So let me kind of go back. Um, I'll tell everyone kind of what my background is because it might help put in perspective some of what I was talking about and kind of where my opinion comes from. And one thing I do say is I by no means hold myself out as the expert in, you know, this career transition work. I'm just- That's what experts say. (laughs) I'm just someone that has an opinion and has been through some experience. So- um, education wise, I have a Bachelor of Arts degree with honors in international relations, which was a history political science um, major uh, from Mount Allison and a Master of Arts in military history from the University of New Brunswick. So I, I graduated 20 years ago this year. Um, it goes by really quick. And <laughs> Congratulations. So, and I, I live the struggle of, you know, an, a recent graduate with an arts degree, random summer job experience um, hitting, you know, the labor market 20 years ago. So, you know, when I graduated with my master's, I had worked as a waiter. I had worked for an electronics store, um, worked in a museum one summer. So it was a very odd mishmash of, you know, experience to go along with my degrees. So from 2001 to four, I really lived, you know, the struggle of a recent arts grad trying to find my way. So I was, I didn't network. I didn't know a lot about how to market myself. It was really, you know, sending um, a resume, hoping for the best, never hearing back. So, you know, during that time I did, you know, a series of minimum wage jobs and I'm not going to talk about all the companies, but some less than desirable jobs I had. And it was tough. I mean, with a master's degree, you know, I'd invested seven years and a lot of money. And so it was a real struggle. Uh And, you know, firing out resumes, fingers crossed, never hearing back. So in 2000... Back then, did they have the internet to apply for jobs? They did. Now, you had to still... It was actually a blend. So I was um, going back to kind of the the pink, you know, resumes. that Um, You know, back in that day, I was actually buying nice paper from Staples and mailing resumes and, um, And you you know, sending it to the email nowhere and like doing all of the above and just trying, trying without the networking piece. Yeah, it didn't network at all. And I was also living in Truro. And that was, you know, probably a mistake I had made looking back on it that where you live is really going to determine the level and a number of opportunities available to you. 
And so, you know, for someone with um, a master of arts degree and no real experience going into a small town, there wasn't a lot of opportunities. And There's a lot of niches there that need to line up. There are. And so in 2004, I went to work for a call center. Um, you know, I took my master's degree and went to work for um, a call center as an agent. So, you know, I was doing frontline calls um, for American cell phone companies. And so I spent a year, um, you know, in a frontline role, and it actually ended up being one of the most valuable experiences of my career, because communication skills are so valued. And that year of experience, every time the phone rang in my ear, I didn't know if it was someone who would be yelling at me, who was really pleasant or anything in between. Yeah. So it was great kind of practice on how to handle different personality types. So if anyone does, you know, after graduation um, through either choice or by, you know, necessity winds up in a contact center, look at it as very, very valuable um, experience you're gaining, great communication yeah. skills. Uh, so from there, I ended up spending five years in the contact center world. Um, and I did it specifically because I thought I could advance up and get some experience to go on my resume. So it wasn't that I wanted to spend my career there. It was really a means to an end. And so I was fortunate, you know, I maintained pretty good attendance and was able to get promoted up to being a trainer, uh, then a sales coach, a sales manager, and an operations manager by the end of it. So oh, I'm just I, so curious. I'm so curious because it can't just be that you showed up, right? It can't just be like an attendance tick box. Um. No. So what it actually was, I mean, the reason I could stand out there was I was fairly good at talking to people. Um, so, you know, in terms of just letting someone vent, so I could de-escalate people quite well. Uh, and I was good at selling. It was actually somewhat surprising that it wasn't, I didn't find it that difficult, um, you know, to sell, upsell cell phone products. So it was actually probably those three things, that, you know, having good attendance, actually showing up to work, uh, having good customer satisfaction scores and understanding how to sell uh, were probably the biggest reasons that I was able to move up. Thanks. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to kind of bore everyone with what that five years look like, but, you know, by the end of it, the last couple of years, I was managing a hundred plus agents, um, seven managers. So I kind of went from the very bottom to the very top, uh, went through a layoff um, after five years. So yeah, it, uh, you know, it ended up being a great, um, you know, benefit to me. So I would kind of use that as an example that if, you know, you ever do experience a layoff in your career, look at it as a glass half full type of moment rather than the world's coming to an end. We've uh, had a lot of layoffs on, on the podcast. Um, I love hearing about them because it's people think that it's like this or like this that your career is. And it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's, and it happens to every, you know, not yeah. everyone, but it's not it a rare a occurrence. It happens to a lot of people. Or and contracts not being renewed or whatever version, or you think you're going in and you're going to get like a five out of five and you get a 2.5 and you're put on like a, performance improvement plan, right? Or, you know, yeah. whatever version. Yeah. It happens. So when my career um, with the call center ended, so that was after five years, that was when I moved to Halifax. So I came here 11 years ago. I knew one person in Halifax and I had no job. Um, plus, you know, my five years of call center experience and yes. my degree. So from there, I went to work for Xerox. Uh, so that got me into the business to business sales world. So I kind of took my experience um, from the call center world and selling electronics, took it you know, to Xerox, and I was doing inside sales and account management. So you know, we were calling, one of the jobs was calling into public sector accounts in the United States, essentially doing customer service calls, making sure that they were happy with Xerox. So I did that for about six months. Um, I was, got to help create a lead generation program targeting the Fortune 500 um, executives. Uh, so I did that for about a year. And then I managed an account with IBM for about another year. Uh, after two and a half years, um, I was actually approached through LinkedIn by ADP, the payroll company. So it's a, you know, a great example of LinkedIn helping you tap into the hidden job market because ADP mm. at the time had decided they were growing their sales team and decided to headhunt from Xerox. So they approached a number of us um, through LinkedIn, you know, with, um, you know, a better compensation package, different opportunity. So a number of us made that move to ADP. So I did about three years with them doing, um, it was technology sales and account management. So payroll technology, HRIS systems, time management systems. 
Not the most. Oh, are you responsible for the making people count their time in a six minute increments? Uh, sort of, yes. I was at least giving businesses the tools to make them do that. Okay. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, selling payroll services wasn't the most um, satisfying job, I'll say that, you know, it, it serves a purpose, but I was really struggling with job satisfaction after payroll and photocopier sales. Yeah. Basically, so, everybody, every office person's like nightmare. Go on. Yeah. So uh, after three years at ADP, they did a mass layoff of my team. So, you know, went mm. through a second layoff. And so <laughs> then I was- Harder a, or easier than the first one? Way easier. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah. By the time the one at ADP happened, a lot of us had been through one or, you know, knew people that did. So, yeah, you know, we kind of all gathered um, that afternoon, had a drink together, said, you yeah, know, it was fun. On to the next chapter. Yeah, love it. So yeah, after that, I was at a bit of a crossroads because by that time I'd spent about 10 years in, you know, the contact center environment and doing inside roles. So, you know, sitting in an office, but doing sales and account management in other parts of North America. Mm -hmm. So I decided then, and this was about six years ago now, to look at getting into the recruiting industry because I thought it would be good to build up a network locally. I was yeah. getting, you know, it didn't really make sense to have a random network of people scattered throughout North America. And I wanted to get to know all the hiring managers in the city and, you know, get to learn how recruiting worked. So I was able to get a job with Kelly Services, which is another of the Fortune 500 staffing companies um, as their business development manager for Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. So, you know, all of a sudden I'm talking to companies, having recruiting discussions, have no idea what I'm talking about, but, you know, I was faking it until I made it, um, essentially. Yeah, just on, on the job learning, right? Yeah, and I learned so much. And because I knew how to sell that type of, of recruiting and staffing services, Adeco approached me, um, not even a year later, about being their branch manager. And again, they approached me through LinkedIn. And I like to say, you know, they could have found a hundred people here that had more recruiting experience than me. They came to me because I knew how to do sales in that mm. industry. And that was actually a key driver. So, you know, understanding how to sell actually led me into getting a management opportunity. So yeah. then I was managed, you know, went from having never worked in recruiting. Um, a year later, I'm now managing a multi-million dollar staffing and recruiting operation. And it was definitely, you know, faking until I made it and flying by the seat of my pants every day. You okay, I'm just gonna push back on that because we all have, a lot of us are kind of told this myth, like you have to have all the skills on the job thing in order to like do it successfully or, you know, or we have these things that we're told or that we believe in, but oftentimes we can dig into our bag of tricks and experiences and apply them just in new and novel ways that we don't yet experience. And if it feels like faking it a little bit, Maybe we can tell ourselves that, um, but then it's really just leveraging our community who wants us to succeed. It's leveraging our past experiences and applying it in a different way. I just, I want to push back because, you know, it's, it's okay to like, you know, to be humble, but at the same time, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a part of it where if they put you beside the person you're interviewing against, you're like, I'm effing amazing. Like, and let me tell you why. <laughs> fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. And so you're right. I mean. I think everyone throughout their career, if they, you know, are ambitious and are looking to advance up, eventually you're going to come into multiple situations probably where you don't have all the experience, you know, <laughs> yeah. someone's giving you an opportunity to step up into something new. So you're going to have to draw on your combined experiences. And, you know, I do say, um, you know, I've faked it until I made it only because I think it's natural and some people will disagree with that term and that's okay too. Uh, I think it's natural though when you're first stepping up into a new type of position, whether it's your first entrance into management, into senior leadership, um, you know, or into, you know, a brand new sector that I think there's some normal apprehension early on that it's, you know, you can't walk in on day one and feel hundred percent confident. So, but I think sometimes you have to feel hundred percent confident or, you know, at least be able to project that. Yeah. And so, and I found particularly doing business development, you often had mm -hmm. to fake it a little bit at first, because you were talking, especially, you know, with recruiting, I'll, I'll use that as an example. You know, I had, we'll say two or three months or four months into my job with Kelly Services, I could be talking to someone who's been an HR director for 20 years. Yeah. And I'm trying to talk on their level, even though I've been doing this for three months. Yeah. And so, you know, 
I, I did. I had to kind of, you know, I make them believe that I knew probably more than I did at the time. Just let them know that you communicated effectively that you are, you either know their needs or are willing to learn and understand and then ensure that they get, um, that you satisfy the contract, that you can deliver, that you can understand and, and kind of bring that. Yep. So, yeah, I don't think there's, you know, anything wrong with feeling like you have to, you know, maybe fake it a little bit until mm -hmm. you do feel confident. Um, but again, uh, I think if you are going to, you know, really push yourself, the first time you become a CEO, when you walk into an office, whether it's, you know, a Fortune 500 company or, you know, a smaller one, your first day as a CEO, you're going to, you know, have self-doubt. You're going to be thinking, I'm the leader of the ship. And so, yeah, you know, it's... Just bring it back to your past experience. Like, ask yourself, how did you feel the first day you walked into university? For myself, yep. I was like, oh, there's no way I should be here with all these smart people. And then, you know, give it a little bit. And I'm like, okay, I'm cool. Like, it's fine. <laughs> right? Like everything, it's only new once. It's your only your first day as CEO once. It's only this once. And giving yourself some grace. And yeah, pumping yourself up. You're like, okay, I'm going to fake it till I make it. Or, okay, I'm going to, you know, dive on this. Like, I'm going to talk to five of my CFO friends and get like their five best tips. And I'm going to like emulate that or whatever the language is. I just point back on the language just a little bit because yeah. um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page for like drawing from that experience. Absolutely. And then, so just kind of finishing off, you know, my story. So uh, yeah, I got this job with the Halifax partnership um, just about four years ago now, and I've loved it. So, you know, everything I've talked about, you know, it's what I've learned having, you know, hundreds of kind of recruiting discussions over the last few years, but I've also been through about 70 interviews in my life, um, you know, professional type interviews, starting out with my one to get my first call center job and winding up with my Halifax partnership one. Um, good and bad. Uh, I've bombed, you know, a handful of interviews. Uh, You're you know, human. Yeah, you, you live and learn. And, you know, I didn't always understand how to prepare, um, you know, kind of the, the idea of a marketing pitch behind an interview. So, and now not to say I've gotten, you know, 70 interviews sounds like a lot, but, you know, my last job with the Deco was nine interviews over three months um, that I had to do. So, and then I, you know, I've had a handful of jobs that I haven't got that I've done, you know, two or three or four interviews yeah. for jobs. I have got that I've done two or three or four interviews yeah. for. So it does add up over a while, but that's kind of where, you know, some of these tips are coming from. It's really kind of both sides of the table as a job seeker, but as someone that's talked to, you know, hundreds of hiring managers, recruiters over the last six years too. No, that's, that's incredible. It's really nice to get um, somebody with your expertise that's seen, seen both sides and be able to communicate that with, um, with our audience and just share and be so generous with sharing. Uh, I do want to ask you one thing, and this is um, internally in business. Sometimes we get into our silos and we say, oh, we're marketing or, oh, we're accounting or, oh, we're finance or, oh, I'm strategy. And we get very like siloed and, and like I take on that identity. So when we hear terms um, from other, you know, you know, this is marketing, it's, it's self-marketing. Sometimes it takes on a different connotation to different people. So I just want to understand where you're coming from when you tell people that they need to be able, oh, accounting students, when you tell them that, you know, you're really marketing yourself for a job and in such a way that they, there's no way that they could interpret that negatively. Because I feel like you and I know that it's, it's one thing to have the skill set and it's the other thing to put your shoe on the other foot and say, man, when you're hiring, you just want to know that the person that you're seeing on paper will show up and execute. So can you just maybe unpack that marketing term a little bit for those of us that are in our accounting silos? Like, oh, that's, that's not us. Sure. Well, and you know what? It's not me either. You know, I've got two arts degrees, so I never once studied marketing. Um, so when I say marketing, it actually goes back to, you know, my sales days. And I'll, I'll try and tie this into, you know, a, a sales process. So let's say an organization is, and I'll tie this back to accounting to make it as relevant as I can. So let's say an organization is in need of a new um, accounting package. So, you know, they've uh, been doing everything um, on an old paper ledger. Now they've decided they're going to upgrade and get, you know, um, either QuickBooks or uh, Sage, one of these accounting packages. So they have a business problem that they're, you know, going to look to buy something to address. So, you know what, we can't use paper ledgers in 2021, we need to upgrade to a digital system. So, and it's the same thing when they're looking to hire. So when companies are looking to hire, they've got a problem that they're trying to address when they hire. Now, just going back to the, you know, accounting systems. So 
the company decides we need, you know, a, a computerized accounting system. They put out an RFP, a request for proposals, saying, is, which is essentially a job posting, except it's for a product. We're looking for a product that can do X, Y, and Z. So they can run ad hoc reports that can take Excel imports from, you know, different systems. And it's easy to use. So the same thing. Um, so they're going to have different vendors come in. So they're going to have, uh, you know, Sage come in. They're going to have QuickBooks, ActPack. Uh, and they're all going to talk about, we have this great product. It does has these features, these applications, these benefits to the company. And from that, they're going to pick one successful, you know, product. And that's who they're going to go with. Same thing when you're talking a job search. That you know, a company's identified they have a challenge that they need to hire someone. They put out a job posting, and job postings can either be you know very very good or very very bad. So you're going to get the full spectrum. But from there, you know, everyone who applies essentially is pitching a different set of skills um, and capabilities that they offer. So when I talk about marketing, it's really marketing what your specific set of skills and capabilities are. Um, versus, you know what, the other, you know, 40 people who have applied. Because, you know, if you think about it from a marketing perspective, and I, even though I'm going back to marketing, I'll tie this back to another example. So imagine Coca-Cola, which, you know, even if you're not a marketing professional, um, you know that they're one of the most valuable brands in the world. They're, you know, legendary in terms of how they market. Yeah. But they don't just, you know, say Coca-Cola, try us, we're good. <laughs> you know, that's not how they market. So they use, um, and for a hundred plus years, have used a series of creative um, images and, you know, slogans, words to convey different emotions. And I would say, you know, look at job searching the same way mm. that, you know, you have to look at what can you offer a prospective employer? Because saying, I'm Nathan, I have a degree from Dell and I'm a really nice guy is not going to really get you that far. There's gonna to be too many people that are taking that approach. And, you know, again, if you're only looking at interviewing five out of 50, the people who really understand how to sell their experience and what their value is, uh, they're gonna be the ones that are most likely gonna get the interviews because they're going to, you know, it's not gonna be kind of the generic marketing documents, you know, LinkedIn and resume. Someone, some of the people do get how to do this and get the idea of, you know, what are my most relevant skills? How can I present them in the most desirable and appealing way to a prospective employer? So there's always a core group of people, you know, whether it's 10 or 15% of job seekers that do that very well. And they typically are the ones that, you know, will find the quickest success. Does that make sense or do we need to do No, 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 no. This is great. No. And I, I just wanted to let you talk because I am the, the quintessential interrupting cow, right? So, <laughs> and, I, and I know that like you're a talker, I'm a talker. I wanted to ask that because it's not like it's smoke and mirrors. You have a great product, like you are great, worthy individuals. So this isn't about tricking anybody into liking you. It is just sharing so that they get an opportunity to see who you are and what value you have so that you can enter this mutually beneficial arrangement where you invest your time and you develop skills and you solve their, you help solve their problem in return and you're remunerated for it. And, you know, we get the world to go round and round and round again. So no, it makes absolutely perfect sense that in order for somebody to get to know you and what you have to offer and your abilities to sell, uh, for me to solve those problems, you do have to, you know, present yourself and build that trust. So it's really about that, that trust building opportunity uh, to, to let them see how wonderful you are. Is that fair? I think that's completely fair. Okay. And I am, I, I, I just feel so out of my depth in all of this because I have, I, I don't even know, I should really take a look back. Uh, for myself personally, I could have benefited from this 14 years ago, because, you know, I was aside from my first firm and aside from Dal, uh, you know, I had a lot, I had a few interviews that didn't go so well. And so how I built my career was through my, my network and how I built my network was through work. Like, uh, you know, so I had my first job in industry. I really liked my boss um, and we ended up staying in touch. And then I got a job offer for after university. And I was like, oh, no, thank you. I want to go like, for this like type of like job, but I really liked him. 
Um, so we stay in touch and every like six months, year and a half, like it wasn't really a set period of time. It's whenever I thought of it, I reached out and we went for coffee. Um, post-graduation or probably post-CA um, designation, his boss or probably his brother was starting up a company. Um, they had half their operations in Calgary, half of them in Vancouver, and they their CFO needed some eyes and ears on the ground to oversee their external accounting. So they're like, hey, Sam, um, like go for coffee. Something like this might open up in the next year or two. You know, so all of these things just, and I had lots of coffees with lots of people and I would talk lots of accounting and none of this was necessarily strategic. It was, I liked what I was doing and I, yeah, I likely had a very like big underlying sense of wanting to always work and feel valuable through that. But I also just liked what I was doing and solving problems and that gets recognized. So, you know, intentional or not, it's not always about, you know, developing these inorganic um, or, you know what I mean? It's not about like, what is my packaging today? But it's about sharing and developing that trust. And like you said, the connector, right? So I think my story likely comes back to more of the connector and getting jobs through, um, you know, word of mouth or having interviews or, you know, developing that trust, solving many problems. Um, because while I may not have been people's first choices, I have time and time again, been their last choice. And I take great pride with that. And I also recognize that there's room to grow and room to learn because, um, you know, how we say things and how we communicate you know, perhaps had we talked 14 years ago, you know, where you're your age with your experience and I'm 14 years. So I'm our students. I think I would have had a lot less stress and a lot more choice and opportunities. So with that, thank you. Yeah. I wish I had known, honestly, a lot of this when I came out too, that because, <laughs> you know, having lived through, you know, the ups and downs and, you know, successes and defeats, I'd say, um, you do kind of see that it's, there's not one silver bullet usually for most people. It's usually who's doing the right things, the right little things consistently on an ongoing basis. And I think if you do those, you know, between getting out there and networking yourself, you know, meeting as many people as you can, um, having the right, you know, documents to kind of market yourself, uh, you know, not just relying on some of the big job boards for opportunities, but, you know, kind of digging deeper to look for opportunities that are a bit more hidden, all of that, you know, if you do the little things, typically good results will follow. Some people that happens quicker than others. Um, but I find if you, you know, having done this a long time and seen a lot of people come through the program, typically the people who do the right, the little things consistently get the result they want in the end. Fabulous. I can think of no, no better way. Um, to wrap up the advice part of that. Now, Nathan, um, part of the show is I always, I'm so curious because we've gotten to know about you a lot uh, and a lot of your feedback. I also want to know how you define success because it's so personal and so unique to everybody. And I'm just really curious how you define it for yourself. It's strange. I think if you were to ask me this at different points in my career, I would have defined it differently. Mm. Um, you know, when I was in my mid twenties, we'll say I would have defined success as just getting a professional job. Mm. I didn't really care what or who. Um, it was just, you know, I didn't want to be in the service industry and in retail. Like I wanted to do something with my degree, you know, start to build a career. So, you know, 15 years ago, that was what my answer would be is just give me a job, um, you know, a white collar job. Uh, over time, it's, you know, really evolved. Um, I mentioned, you know, there was times in my career where I didn't have a lot of job satisfaction. Yeah. So if I had to say now, you know, what success is, it's finding the sweet spot in your career where you're balancing out, you're getting the right level of financial compensation to lead the life you want, hopefully doing something that you're interested in um, and that you find rewarding. I think if you can find that sweet spot, then, you know, at least for me, that's what I define success as, because I look at, you know, the job I do now, and after having spent a long time doing, you know, jobs that weren't as satisfying, I get, you know, messages on a weekly basis from people who, you know, say, because of this introduction or this tip that you gave me, you know, I, I'm now in my career, and, you know, thank you so much. And so really, the knowing that I'm actually making an impact on someone's life, and, you know, I, there's, you always wish, there's always stories that, you know, the pe person I wish I could have helped, you know, find a job or find a certain connection that haunt me, but the success that we see, you know, on an ongoing basis. So I think that, you know, for me, that is probably my definition of success. It's, you know, financial compensation with job satisfaction with work-life balance. 
Um, Cause I think the work-life balance can sometimes get overlooked. And, you know, I know for me personally, it's definitely become more important the further I've gone in my career mm. that, you know, I no longer want a job that, you know, is 90 hours a week, but, you know, 45, 40, 45 is good for me. So I'd say that's my success. If you can find the sweet spot between those three things, um, you're successful. Cool. Thank you. Now, I really, really, really do appreciate that. And I, what I love and a theme that we've started to see is that it has evolved for many people over their careers or people starting off their careers have acknowledged this will likely change. And it's so it's personal. It could evolve, may evolve, has evolved for many people. So thank you. I, I think that that is fantastic insights. And I, I do need to apologize. I know I ragged on you a little bit about um, the, you know, you, you're like the office workers like nightmare between I just had a moment going back to the firm where the paper just wouldn't go through the photocopier. And then I had to like figure out how to block my 12 minutes of time for this happening. But honestly, B2B is so rewarding in so many sense because, you know, having, having like the small stuff, it becomes the big stuff and you can't help your clients and you can't like, it's all, we're all part of this web that works together. And I really do think that, you know, every part of your career, even if it's not day to day where you think you want to be, or it's not the moment that's fulfilling, you're building tools. It will help you in the next thought. There's people that you're helping and ability to do good. And Hey, it could lead you to, um, to the next place where you truly are. You don't have to look for the bright side of it. You just are in all the bright sides of it. Yeah. And I think, you know, it leads into the idea of, you know, for your students and anyone listening to be open to a nonlinear career path, that I think sometimes, you know, especially when we're coming out of school, we all have a vision of what our career is going to look like. The, you know, manager by 30, director by 40, VP at 45. And, but what you find happen, and I did the same thing, you know, if you had asked me 20 years ago. Oh, what I'm I, dead by 65, but sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Hopefully not. I thought you were going to keep going. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe 95. Sorry. But no. Yes, yes, the goal. We're trying to get life expectancy here, I'm sorry. But yeah, if you, you know, asked me 20 years ago where I thought my career would wind up, you know, it was maybe working in government somewhere, um, you know, being an analyst for the military, possibly, you know, everything that was just, you know, I thought potentially related to my degree. But what you find out, and especially I think people that have accounting backgrounds, because it's such a, um, a great profession, you know, there's so many different avenues you can go down with that that you may envision your career that, you know, I'm going to go work for one of the big firms, wind up as a partner. Uh, But, you know, in between the next 20 years, you're going to get dozens of job opportunities over LinkedIn. You may go through a layoff or two. Um, You know, you just never know. So, you know, try and be aware that there are going to be different opportunities come your way. And that's why I got back to the career management piece. And when you come Mm. to forks in the road, you know, do I want to continue on, you know, my kind of firm path or, you know, do I want to look at this, you know, startup opportunity that, you know, um, I can be a director of finance for a startup or do I want to continue to be an auditor with one of the big firms? So, and, you know, you're going to problems to have good problems to have. So yeah, just be aware that, you know, don't follow too strict of a path, you know, have some flexibility. You just never know what opportunities are going to come your way. And through networking, through LinkedIn, um, there's headhunters out there every day scouring LinkedIn for people. So you just never know what you're going to see. And so, yeah, be open to a a nonlinear career path. I can almost guarantee um, for 99.9% of you, it is not going to unfold the way you expect. And that is a good thing. If somebody tells me exactly how my career will end up, I I'm like, man, thanks for taking the fun out of it. Right. And fun is the ups, the downs, the good days, the other days. And just, yeah, don't, don't lock yourself in and miss out on some really cool stuff. I think is a fantastic message. Thank you. Um, I, I almost hesitate on asking this because you like, you just provided so much value. Any, any final thoughts or words, or can people reach out to you now or should they wait? Or if they even wanted to say, Hey, and thank you, or I learned this. Sure. So in terms of coming into the connector program, um, we do work with a lot of financial backgrounds. So when you're within four to six months of graduating, um, please feel free to reach out either to me directly um, or through the Halifax Partnerships website. We've also launched an app called Connector Plus. So when you get into the, um, again, into four to six months from graduation, it's essentially digitizing the Connector program process. So you could look at um, both downloading the app as well as participating in the Connector program. 
So I definitely encourage you to do that. And you know, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, if you'd like to send me a message, uh, please do give me a day or two to respond because uh, I do get quite a lot of emails and messages. Uh, and you know, certainly, you know, follow me. I do share a lot of job postings. You know, interesting information um, that I think you know my network would be interested in. So if there is, um, yeah, uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'd love to be connected with you because uh, again, you're the next generation, and you know what? And they are amazing. <laughs> They really are. Like, it's scary. Well, and you're coming out of a great school and a great program, you know, into a very favorable labor market. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's the, the future is very bright. Um, hopefully we can stay on a good track with COVID and, uh, and we can keep kind of opening things up. But, yeah, just know you're coming into, you know, I think a very favorable um, city at a very good place in time. And whatever I can do, you know, to be of assistance, I do engage with Dell quite a bit. So you may see me at a presentation over the next year or two. Um, but please feel do free to yell with... potato skins. <laughs> yeah, uh, that'll be the code word. That'll be the the end. That'll be the thing. <laughs> so yes, if anyone does see me, please yell that just so I know you heard it. And yeah, uh, <laughs> oh. that'd be great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Keisha, our producer, we were talking the other day. And he mentioned that um, many of our episodes have been evergreen in the sense that we talk about, we try to talk about more or less like time, timeless information that might be helpful and useful. So I can tell you that um, I do plan on sharing that this year and for years to come. So thank you so much for investing your time with our students and with a broader audience. So Nathan Laird, thank you. Thank you very much. And for anyone that hears this in the years to come, um, please connect with me on LinkedIn as well. I've got 20 years left of my career, so uh, I definitely want to meet the next generation coming along. Nice. And it's a winner for the long haul. Thank you. Exactly.